Welcome. We are so thankful that you have joined with us to watch this message. We pray it will be a blessing to you, that we'll all learn from it, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in watching the message at this time. Let's pretend it's Christmas morning. You have a new job and you're earning all kinds of money. So this year, you went all out for presents for your family. Your 16-year-old sister loves the singer Dua Lipa. And so you bought her four front row seats to a concert. She is going to be so excited to take three of her best friends to go see the singer. Your 14-year-old brother loves to play the guitar, hopes to be in a band someday, but he has an old, cheap, hand-me-down guitar, and so you went out and bought him a CE24 bolt-on Paul Reed Smith guitar. He is going to love this thing. You have an 8-year-old sister who loves to dance, and she's been dancing since she's 4 years old, and she's been wanting this new pair of dance shoes, so you bought her a Sodanka dance pair of dance shoes. And your mom, she loves to cook. She's had her eye on this special French cookware set. A 12-piece Mauville French brushed copper cookware set. It's, she is going to be ecstatic when she sees this thing. It's the ultimate in elegant cookware. Your dad, he loves to watch videos and movies and he's been wanting a surround sound so you went to Bose and you bought him the ultimate 650 home theater entertainment system. It features a 360 degree sound, glass top finished acoustic mass module with quiet port technology. Oh, he is going to be glued to that TV set and listening to these sounds as he watches his movies. You can hardly wait for Christmas morning. And it arrives. And as each family member opens their gifts, they are just ooing and eyeing and thanking you. And you just feel so much gratitude inside. But as a few weeks pass, you notice a change in everyone. The night of the concert for your sister, she decided to go to a birthday party with her friends instead of the concert. Broke your heart. Your 14-year-old brother, he's back to playing his old guitar simply because he says it, it feels better, it fits him better. Your little sister quit dance lessons. She no longer needs the shoes. Your mom admires her new cookware set. Matter of fact, it hangs in the kitchen where everyone can see it. But she knows the oven temperatures and the stovetop temperatures for her old cookware set. And so she doesn't even use the new set. And your dad, your dad, you, you got this surround sound system for him, but he decided to take a couple college courses. And so now, instead of watching TV in the evenings, he spends his time in that very room doing his homework and studies. And since he's in that room, no one else can watch the TV or use the surround sound system either. And you, you're heartbroken. Nobody, no one in the family is using any of their gifts that you bought for them. We continue with our series, Act Like Jesus, and today we're looking at spiritual gifts. The question is, do you have a spiritual gift or gifts, and are you using them? Well, today we're going to just look at the very, very basics of spiritual gifts. We're going to touch the tip of the iceberg or fly over at 40,000 feet, we might say. So we're not going to get deep into it. So if you want to learn more, come and talk to me and we'll discuss how we can get you to teach, uh, how you can learn on more about your spiritual gifts. Let's begin by talking about our natural abilities. At the point of conception, God gave each and every one of us some natural abilities and they all vary. Similar maybe in some sorts, but varying in different extents. For example, to some people, God gave a phenomenal voice to sing. They can hear the music, they can sing the music, they can be right on key. Now, for example, my dad, 
loved to sing. My dad loved music, but he couldn't carry a tune in the bucket. We'd get into church on Sunday morning and dad would sing out with everyone else, but he'd be off key just enough that it was hard to sing beside him. But he loved God and he praised God and we glorify God with the voices that we have. But some people have the gift of that phenomenal perfect voice and the gift of being able to use it and to stay perfectly on key. Others, God gave the ability to run or swim. To some, God gave the ability to think deeply. They can hear something and they've got it. Their, their mind is like a sponge. Now these same people may forget where they parked the car, or they might even forget their daughter's basketball game that was at four o'clock. But see, God gives us varying abilities, varying degrees, and these are our natural gifts that God gave us at birth. Just a few examples here on how God has gifted us with these different things. Some abilities are very noticeable and some abilities are not so noticeable. For example, we're in basketball season and who do you always see or uh, praise the most in a basketball game? It's the player that scores the most points. They're the ones that wins the game for everybody, right? But see, if you're a real basketball enthusiast, you also watch who is the person that passed the ball to the player that made the shot? Who is the person that's best on defense or the other aspects of the games? Now, I'm not an avid basketball fan, so I know the guy or the gal that scored the most points. But they wouldn't be scoring the most points if it wasn't for everyone else. So you see, when God gives us abilities, some abilities may be more noticeable than others, and some abilities may be less noticeable, but they're all vital. So if you've got a, a, maybe a lesser notable ability, you're just as important, and that ability is just as valuable as the one that is doing what's getting a lot of attention. These are the abilities that God gave us at birth. So what about our spiritual gifts? Well, just as God gives each one of us a ability, natural ability when we're born the first time, God gives us a spiritual ability when we're born the second time. Now, first time I mean the physical birth, and second time I mean when we're born again at baptism and we receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then we notice or receive these other gifts also. These spiritual gifts often complement our natural abilities. Now, the New Testament has several teachings on spiritual gifts. Some are very, very uh, noticeable because the writer is mentioning the gifts. There's other writings that maybe aren't so uh, popular and noticeable about the spiritual gifts, but we're going to pick one this morning from the Apostle Paul that he wrote to the church at Rome. So we're going to go to the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. And like I said, we're beginning at the very basics of spiritual gifts. Paul writes in verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Our point is that use of our spiritual gifts require that we humble ourselves and conform to God. It requires that we humble ourselves and conform to God. Now we're going to focus a little bit more on this conforming here, but this sounds easy, doesn't it? I mean, humble ourselves and conform to God? Not quite as easy as you think. Let me ask you this. How many times have you maybe signed up for an online class and you maybe paid money for the class? And when the class started, you were excited, but maybe it took place uh, once a week for several weeks or once a day for maybe a whole week. How many of you actually finished that class or that course? Even though you signed up for it, 
You maybe even paid the money for it, but you lost enthusiasm or you got busy and you never finished the course. Or maybe you signed up for a class that would be a weekend class or a, a one-night class or a one-day class, maybe an all-day Saturday class. And you went to the class, you attended it, you were excited about it, you took all kinds of great notes, you came home, you laid your notes down and forgot about them. Life got busy. You had other things to do. You were distracted. And you never went back and looked at your notes. You never implemented what you learned. And see what I'm saying here is that a lot of times we get excited. We get enthused about something. But then we don't carry it out. Starting the task is often easy. Completing the task is difficult. It takes an effort. It requires action. And it often requires repetitive action. You can't just do it once. It's like forming a new habit. You have to break the old habit by repetitively doing whatever new thing that you're doing so that you can form this new habit. Let me ask you this. Valentine's Day is today. So let me ask you about maybe your old habits. You know, dating doesn't take much conforming to the other person. Dating is pretty easy. Whatever is at home, we leave it at home and we go on the date. We meet the person and we're on our best behavior during the date, whether it's a movie or eating out or, or whatever the thing might be that the two of you have agreed to do. It's, it's a short period of time where you're on your best behavior and then you go back home. But let's say that you decide to get married you went to the ceremony, you went on the honeymoon, and then you came home. And now you're discovering these habits that each of you have. Uh, maybe leaving clothes, dirty clothes, lay all over the place. Maybe you do the washing and you, you leave everything in the uh, laundry basket, and so you just use out of the laundry basket all week long. Maybe you cook for your meals and you don't bother cleaning up. You've got dirty pots and pans sitting around, dirty dishes. Maybe you're not the best housekeeper. and The floor's a little bit dirty. The furniture's a little bit uh, dusty. And see, when you're by yourself, these things don't matter because you're the only one that you have to worry about. But once you're married and now you've got someone else that you need to conform to some of their ways also. Now, they're going to have to conform to your ways too, but you also are going to have to conform to your spouse's ways. And so you have to form new habits. You have to work at it. And it's going to take some effort to repeat these things in order to get better at it. New habits require conforming to another person. But when we're talking these spiritual gifts of forming, developing new habits with God, We've got to also break our old habits in order to develop these new habits with God. And so it's much the same way. What we're comfortable with doing on our own without God, now we have to think about God and we have to work to form these new habits. In other words, it's one thing to find your spiritual gift. It's another thing to make use of it, to start working at it and start doing this. So how's the best way to form this new habit, to conform? Well, it's simply love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And it's a humbling effect. Same way with your sweetheart. You get married to him or her. And because you love this person so dearly, you're willing to make new habits and to conform to their ways because you love them with all your heart and you get the idea of what we're, where we're going to on this. And so when it comes to God, we have to work at this. And it's easy at first, and it gets more difficult as time goes by because you're going to want to revert to your old habits. But what we're saying here is that we have to humble ourselves and conform to God's will and God's way, not only to discover these habits, but then to actually carry them out. Humble and conform ourselves. Let's continue with verse 3. And this carries on with humility. 
For by grace, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Let me repeat part of that. Let's pause here. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Now here Paul is really nailing this humility aspect. See, God cannot use a proud person. Oh, well, he can and he has. The Old Testament has examples where Israel sinned or a, a godly person sinned and then God used a proud person, maybe even an evil person, to bring about the reformation of that person or the, uh, to, to bring about the punishment. But God is not going to continually use a proud person. He might use the proud person for a moment or an instant or one thing. But many of these in the Old Testament, these proud people went on to destruction. So to, in order for God to use you and me to use our spiritual gifts, we have to be humble people and conform to God's will and God's way. Verse 4, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Now, for the early church, Paul brought up a new concept that we Christians, as the church, as the body of Christ, made up of different people, we form the body, but we are of different members or different parts of that body. Here's our point. Use of our spiritual gifts requires we come together as one body in Christ. Use of our spiritual gifts require we come together as one body in Christ. Our physical bodies are made up of many members, each vastly different than the other. Uh, for example, our tongue. I'm using my tongue right now to talk to you and you use your tongue to talk to others. Most of the time we don't think anything about our tongues. But when we talk, right now I'm using my tongue to form the T's and the S's. Go ahead and say the letter T and, or the letter S and notice what your tongue is doing. The tongue is very, very vital. and We seldom give our tongues thought unless we accidentally bite it, but our tongues are a vital body part. Now, I digressed back to my younger days, so I don't mean to offend anybody with what I'm about to say, but when I was a kid, we watched cowboy shows. And these cowboy shows, they often had good cowboys and bad cowboys. They often had cowboys and they had Indians. We defined that as Native Americans today. So I don't mean to offend anybody in this illustration, but back then at those times, whenever the bad cowboys confronted the Indians, the Native Americans, sometimes the Native Americans, when they caught the bad cowboys, would cut their cowboys' tongues out. Now you can imagine us as little kids watching this, we would, ah! we'd put our hands over our mouths, we can imagine the pain. But those Indians, those Native Americans, had a whole lot more wisdom than what we little boys had sitting there watching that on a Saturday morning. You see, not only can you not talk very good, but there's other aspects of life that gets really difficult without our tongues. Now, without a tongue to form our T's and S's, we can still kind of muddle through a language, uh, being able to talk to people. It's not going to be good, but we can muddle through it. But think about how you use your tongue when you're eating. That tongue in our mouths is wallowing all over the place, not, not loosely, that's when you bite it. And with precision, your tongue, as you chew, your tongue is forcing food one way or the other to chew your food. You use your tongue to swallow your food. Next time that you're eating, just notice your tongue, and all the things it's doing in there. So our tongues are a vital part of our body that we hardly ever think about or hardly ever consider. 
what happens if we take our tongue out and put our foot in, which we sometimes say we put our foot in our mouth. What if the tongue wasn't there, but the foot was there? Now, feet are good for walking, running, and kicking. Can you imagine eating some food and your tongue or foot decides to kick? Uh, we probably don't want to imagine that. Not very good idea. But see, our bodies are made up of different parts, and each part is vital and in the proper place. A hand is not a foot. Uh, a foot is not an eye. An eye is not your, well, I'm just going to say it, your bottom end, your buttocks. If, if, if your eye were in place of your buttocks, you'd, you'd sit and you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see who you were talking to. See, God placed our body parts in precise locations for the ultimate use of those body parts. So you get the idea when we take this from our physical bodies to our spiritual bodies, the body of Christ, and the gifts that God gives us are vital in the various aspects of the body of Christ. Now we may, some of us may have similar uh, gifts and they, they may look the same but they vary a little bit. So in other words, Maybe one person is a phenomenal singer that leads the singing, but somebody else might be the backup singer. And then other singers are out in the congregation singing. You get the idea that we, we have sometimes the same gifts, but they're used for different aspects. But we come together as one body in Christ, each with these varying gifts. We are the body of Christ, and we use our gifts to glorify Christ the head. So let's talk briefly about these gifts. We go to verse 6, Romans chapter 12, verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, how do these gifts work? Well, here's our point. Use of our spiritual gifts require we discover and engage our gifts. Use of our spiritual gifts require we discover and engage our gifts. And the easiest way to find out what your spiritual gift might be is to look at what is your natural born gift that God gave to you. Uh, let's just give an example here. We've got a snow coming tonight and tomorrow in the forecast. So let's imagine that you're shopping uptown. The sidewalks are snow covered. They don't have them cleared off. There's not enough salt on it. And as you're walking into a store, someone else in front of you slips on the snow. They fall with a crash and they had a bunch of papers in their hands and these papers go flying all over the place and there's a breeze and they're, they're blowing all away. Now, who are you in this example? You see this happening. Are you the one that runs to the person first of all and, and tries to help them and, and give them some comfort and, and to help them See how they are? Maybe you've got a gift of comfort. Or maybe you're the one that sees all these papers blowing in the breeze and so you take off running after the papers. Well, maybe you have a gift of service. Maybe you see this and people seem a little bit disorganized of what they're doing and so you say, here, you, do, do we have a doctor or a nurse here? Would you take care of that person there? Uh, let's get some people organized to pick up these papers. We need somebody to run out there in the parking lot where the papers blew to. Go get those and we'll get these close ones here. Well, maybe you've got a gift of leadership or, or organization or, or management. Maybe your first thought is to start praying. You see that there's a few people taking care of things. So, so your focus is to pray for that person and everyone else helping out. So maybe your gift is prayer. Maybe once everything is calmed down and the person is sitting there, they're okay. They just need to recollect themselves. And maybe you go over and tell them, you know, this happens to all of us. Don't be embarrassed. Uh, you know, you're okay. 
We'll, you'll be able to get back up and get going. We've got your papers. And see, maybe you've got the gift of encouragement. So this is just a simple example, but do you see how in our natural lives, we've, we all tend to go one direction or the other in order to help out or to do something? Well, this is what it's like in our natural life, but that same thing applies to our spiritual gifts also. Maybe you're at church and you see a specific need of uh, whatever it might be. And that's, a, that's something that you've got a natural ability to do, so you volunteer to do it and you step up for it. Maybe you've got a natural ability of, of talking. And so maybe you want to teach. Maybe you want to uh, help out in a uh, class of some way. Maybe you're not the lead teacher, but yet you want to help out in another way of talking to people. Maybe it's giving encouragement to somebody. Maybe it's taking them, giving them some comfort. See, the, the gift of talking, we often call it the gift of gab, it can be used in several ways in the church. It's, it's a gift, a gift that God gave you at birth, but also a gift that maybe is your spiritual gift also. Now, sometimes you might find that your spiritual gift might seem beyond what you're comfortable with. I can remember when I was young, I, I, I had a natural tendency to want to preach or to lead music or do something like that. And I'd often pretend about it, but I can remember the first time I ever got up in front of somebody to lead songs or to preach or even to teach in a Sunday school class. My knees were knocking. I was so nervous. I couldn't remember what I was doing. I, I flubbed up all over the place. But because I loved to do it, I didn't just settle for that first time. I, I learned how I could do it better, and I was mentored by some people and helped me to get better at what I was doing. So, so let's not overlook the need to work at our gift, even though it doesn't go well the first time. On the other hand, maybe you have a gift that you didn't know. Maybe somebody else sees something in you, and you think, oh, no, I, I can't do that. But yet they say, let's try this. You need to step out and try it. Because you might discover that even though you, maybe you don't care to do it, but other people may say, you are phenomenal at this. You are the best teacher, or you are the best uh, caregiver, or the best of whatever it might be. Your, your prayers that you give in public, they're, they're just unbelievable. We love you praying in public. And so you see, it might sometimes take other people recognizing your gift, and then you, you're going to have to step up out of your comfort zone in order to do that spiritual gift that God gave you. Oftentimes it's a discovery process. And sometimes it's a developing process, which most of the time it's always that developing process of refining the gift and to keep working at it. But now remember, Satan does not want you to use your spiritual gift. And so this is why we caution you, if you're just sitting there in church not doing anything, God wants you to use your spiritual gift. Jesus wants you to use your spiritual gift. And Satan is the one that does not want you to use it. Winston Churchill, the great leader of Britain during the World War II, he had a speech impediment. Now, some say it was uh, stuttering. Others say it was a lisp. It doesn't matter. He had a speech impediment. And he had to work through that. He wanted to be a politician. And the first time that he got up to give a political speech, he got laughed off the stage because it was so terrible. He forgot his lines. He got it all jumbled up. And he actually got laughed off the stage. It was an embarrassment. But he didn't give up. He worked and he worked and he worked at his speech giving. He became the prime minister and he is the main reason that Europe does not speak German today. All of the other countries in Europe were, were buckling under to Hitler in Germany, but he held fast. And finally, the United States came to the rescue and with Churchill and the United States and the help of other allies, we defeated Germany and Hitler. But Churchill had to work at his gift. 
He wanted to be that politician. He wanted to speak, but he had to work terribly hard in order to get to where he ended up being. Each of us have a spiritual obligation to use our spiritual gift. Let's not be like the family in this opening illustration where this, this person that we were talking about gave these elaborate gifts to the family, but the family didn't use the gifts and it crushed the person that gave those gifts. See, when you and I don't use our spiritual gifts, it breaks God's heart. We are the body of Christ, and it's our obligation, it's our spiritual duty to discover, refine, and use our spiritual gifts. I guarantee you, our spiritual gift is not to sit in a seat on Sunday morning or on your sofa on Sunday morning and listen to the sermon or a worship service. That is not your spiritual gift. If you're stuck at home and can't do anything, pray. Pray, refine your prayer life, make a prayer list, make it big, pray for, for the community, pray for the family, pray for the city, pray for the state, pray for the country, pray for the world, pray for our leaders. There's so much you can do with prayer. If you're stuck at home, health-wise or whatever, Make it your gift to pray. You can find something. Maybe it's sending out cards of encouragement. Or you can find something to do that will develop and use your spiritual gift. God has given each of us a gift. Each of us need to use it. To glorify Him, find it and use it. Father in heaven, well, we can get all excited about finding a spiritual gift. And there's all kinds of programs out there to help us to discover it. But how many of us actually develop that gift? It's like, okay, we found out what it is. We open the present. We, we see what it is. And then we walk away and don't do anything with it. And that does not give you glory. That does not glorify Jesus as the head of the church. So, Father, I pray for all of us this morning that... We discover our gifts, and I know I'm kind of leaving it on everybody to discover their gifts, and like I said, I'm willing to help them. But our natural abilities are a great clue on what you've helped develop in us a spiritual gift also, what you've given to us. So Father, be with us. Help us to grow in you. Help us to be used of you, to make ourselves as servants in whatever way that it is. We love you, Father. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website, rosscupchurch.org, and that's spelled R-O-U-S-C-U-L-P church.org. You can find information there on how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you or talk with you and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us. Mm -hmm.